Hi, everyone. I'd love to welcome you to our Data Privacy Day 2022 celebration here at Duke University. My name is Jolyn Dellinger. I teach privacy law, policy, and ethics at Duke Law School and at Keenan Institute for Ethics. And I'm joined today by Neil Richards, author of Why Privacy Matters, and my colleague, David Hoffman, who teaches cybersecurity at the Sanford School for Public Policy. So I was thinking this morning uh, that the year we started working on Data Privacy Day was actually the year that the iPhone came out in the United States. And today, smartphones are ubiquitous and many people sleep with them within arm's reach. So our work, our homes, our social lives, our communications, they're all increasingly mediated by emerging technologies and rapidly changing technologies. And while privacy has, of course, always mattered, there are several characteristics of our current information economy that make it crucial that we understand why and how privacy matters for us as individuals and for society at large. And that's what we plan to talk about today. So I'm so grateful to have uh, Professor Neil Richards here, the author of the book, which was incidentally uh, an Amazon editor's choice as one of the 10 best works of nonfiction in December. Um, and also Neil is the distinguished, uh, the Koch Distinguished Professor in Law at the Washington University School of Law, where he also directs the Cordell Institute. Uh, which is an entity that drives policy at the intersection of ethics and data uh, with a focus on data-driven health care and medical research. Notably, also, Neil has been working with Woody Hartzog over the past seven years on the theory of relational privacy, loyalty, and trust. There are several papers on these topics. There's a book in the works. And also another bit of good news, um, they were recently awarded with their team at Cordell a grant to write model duty of data loyalty legislation, um, which is great. So thank you, Neil, for being here. Um, and I'd also like to just say a couple of words um, about Professor Hoffman joining us from Sanford School. Uh, later this hour, we're going to be talking a little bit about innovation the word and what it means. And I have to say that David Hoffman is an innovator in the best possible use of that word uh, when it comes to privacy. Uh, before he began teaching cybersecurity at Intel, David spent over two decades uh, before teaching privacy at, uh, security at Sanford. David spent over two decades at Intel in a variety of positions, um, policy and legal positions, including global privacy officer and director of security policy. He was also the recipient of the IAPP Vanguard Award in 2014. And I just want to know that this award is in part given for showing fearlessness um, in the field of privacy. He's an internationally recognized uh, expert in cybersecurity and privacy, and the man with the idea for Data Privacy Day. Uh, so before we get into the book discussion, I'd just like to turn to you, um, David, if you could give us just a few words on the background of Data Privacy Day and what we're celebrating. Well, Jillian, thank you for one of the most overly generous introductions that I've ever experienced. Uh, and I, I want to thank you for putting this together. And Neil, I want to thank you so much for being willing to do this. Uh, we'll say this many times during the next hour. I absolutely love the book. Anybody who's listening to this right now, get a copy of this book uh, to benefit Neil, buy it, you know, uh, would be great. But if you can't buy it, get a copy, read it. I think it's a fundamentally, incredibly important book. As Professor Dellinger was noting, you know, we've been doing Data Privacy Day since the iPhone came into existence. Privacy has become just that much more important every year as we've been doing this. The original idea came from Data Privacy uh, for Data Privacy. I wish I could take uh, credit for it, but it came from Leonardo Cervera Navas, who was spending a year at Duke and uh, was over at dinner at my house with Professor Dellinger, and who said, "Hey." 
Last year in Europe, they celebrated Data Protection Day for the signing of Convention 108 uh, from the Council of Europe. We should do something here in the United States and it'll make much more sense here in a US context to celebra uh, celebrate Data Privacy Day as a day where we recognize how important privacy is to the functioning of a free society and to notice the shared common values between Europe and the US that where there's much more that we have in common than we do have that is different between the two. And so I can't think of a better way to do that given that Neil is from Europe originally and has written this book that has basically captured all of the themes that we originally said that we thought Data Privacy Day should stand for to have this conversation today. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, and so I'd love to turn um, to Neil to get a little bit of your overview of why you wrote this book, how important it is to you, and a message that you'd like to share about it, the, the overview for our audience. Sure. Uh, th thank you, Jolyn and, and David. And then let me say what a what an honor it is to, to, to be here with you guys um, uh, who are who are truly pioneers in the in the field of privacy law and uh, and to be here at, at, at Duke at, at the Keenan Center, which does such tremendous uh, work and programming and, and, and sponsors such tremendous education and research. So it's it's a, as I was saying before, uh, the only thing that we ever is, is if we were all in person um, in in Durham together. Um, so so let me talk uh, briefly about the I know we want to have a conversation about this and that I think will be will be uh, more fun for us and more, um, and more fun and more more useful for the for the for the many people in the audience let me also say thank you for coming the the audience i mean there's it's it's uh i, I didn't know zoom could hold this many people um so it, it's it's great uh and we hope we uh uh live up to your your hope of, of how to invest this hour um on on data privacy day so i wrote the book why privacy matters because i kept having the same conversation over and over again um, I would meet someone, they'd ask what I did, I'd say I was a law professor, they would say what kind of law do you do, I'd say privacy law, and then I knew what would be coming next. Either they'd say something that was uh, sort of humorous, as, oh you must be very busy, uh, or, or the other times, the more interesting times, they'd say something like, uh, well there is no privacy anymore, is there? And they'd make this sort of funny noise like, uh... Um, as if they're sort of sighing at, at the, the loss of their privacy. And then, and then the, the, the poor person who'd said this to me, whether it was someone who'd made the misfortune of, I'm not an airport, airplane talker, but, but if people make the mistake of talking to me, I'm going to talk back. Um, uh, people, my, my uncle did, did this, my students have done this, my colleagues, uh, the, the, the woman who, who's cut our family's hair for the last 18 years, um, and, and most notably, an Uber driver uh, in, funnily enough, in Silicon Valley, um, who was taking me from my hotel in, in Palo Alto to Stanford, where I was giving a talk on my last book. Um, th that poor woman was subjected to a mercifully short, because it was a short Uber ride, uh, version of, of what I say in the book, that the privacy isn't dead, the privacy isn't dying, the privacy is about power, privacy enables so many wonderful things that, that are uh, really at, at, at the core of what it means to be a human being and a human being living in a free society that uh, uh, I realized I should probably write down what I had to say. Um, so maybe not so that I could you know, recommend the book to them, but just it would be a useful exercise because people seem to have not just misconceptions about privacy, um, but a, but a wanting to be told, to be reassured that privacy isn't dead, it isn't dying, it, it is important, and to, to put the sentences together and the paragraphs together and the chapters together to make the clear, succinct, hopefully persuasive case for the continued vitality and essentialness of privacy um, on the occasion of its supposed death. So, so the, the book does six things, and I'll, I'll run through them really quickly, and we can, and we can talk about them. They, they correspond to the six chapters in the book. Um, but the first, the first chapter, if we're going to talk about privacy, 
we need to know what we're talking about, right? We need to have a, a, a at least a provisional definition um, so that the reader can know what I mean when I say privacy, uh, what it is, why it's not dying, why we should protect it. Um, and so aware that privacy scholars have spent decades trying and failing to come up with a definition of privacy, um, I, I settle on a, on a provisional descriptive definition of privacy just as the extent or de the degree to which human information is neither known nor used. And there, there's four parts of this definition that I think are worth highlighting. Um, the first thing is when I say privacy, I'm talking about information privacy. So not decisional privacy, not spatial privacy, even though if, as we find, maybe we'll talk about this, when we talk about things like abortion rights or uh, spatial privacy, these disputes, these issues, these cases often have a significant and increasingly significant informational component. Second, it's about humans, human information. So uh, this locates us towards data collected about people rather than data collected about pets. Pets are important, pets are great, but um, and they may have privacy rights, but not of the sort that I'm talking about in this book. Um, in addition, right, a lot of the technologies we use to monitor human beings are also used to monitor uh, climate temperature. They're used to monitor the growing of crops. They're used to, to, to monitor uh, the weather. Those are important technologies, but by focusing on human information, it focuses on the use of these technologies to monitor humans. And it also focuses on human values, which I think are both imperiled by these technologies and, and important to be safeguarded by good, sensible, uh, progressive privacy rules. I talk third about it being information being used as well as known. Um, it, it's, it's a common misconception when we talk about privacy that people say, oh, once my information is collected, it's just out there. Um, and I think information collection rules and, and focusing on surveillance and the collection of data is really important. But we also need to talk about what happens to that data once that information is collected. And as privacy lawyers, we know um, just as a secret that only I know is still a secret when I tell Joe Lynn and, and, and maybe we tell David as well, it's still a, it's still a secret. Um, so too, it, our, our privacy policies, right? Here at Company X, we care about your privacy, but here are some things we, here's the information we collect and what we do with it. Um, privacy law, going back to the fair information practices um, in the 19, early 1970s and before that, the, the notions of fiduciary confidentiality and loyalty is all about what happens to that information that is colloquially out there. Um, so we need to worry about that too. And then finally, privacy is a matter of degree, right? The, it, very little information now or in the past has either been known only to me in my heart of hearts um, or known to everybody in the world, like the fact that uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon were in the Beatles. Uh, most information, most of the time, the overwhelming fraction of information the overwhelming proportion of the time exists in these intermediate states and our law should reflect that known social reality. So that's what privacy is. In, in chapter two, I offer a theory of privacy as rules, meaning, meaning the provisional definition is great and it locates our attention. But when we think about privacy, we should think less about the perfect, I'm, I'm revealing that I'm a law professor here rather than a philosopher, and I feel bad at an ethics center saying this, but um, we should focus less on the perfect philosophical definition of privacy for all time, and much more on the rules that govern the degree to which human information is known or used. Um, and so this is because privacy, and the, the single most important thing about the book, the, the single most important thing about privacy, if you take, if you take one thing from, from our conversation today, I would say that it is that privacy is about power. Information is power, and human information confers power over human beings. That's why Target and Facebook and Google or Mercedes or, or ad networks or the NSA that's why they want to collect personal information is to influence human behaviors, to influence your behavior, um, either to um, not read certain things they don't want you to read or to read certain things or to click certain links or to buy certain products. Um, uh, even as parents, we use uh, information technology to 
monitor our children. I, I, I understand there are video cameras now for baby monitors. We had audio monitors, like I'm sure uh, uh, my, my co-panelists are, are in that group too. Um, but you, you, put, you monitor your kids to keep them safe, to influence their behavior so they don't do really dumb things. We still use find my friends, right? To, to keep an eye on our, our uh, high school and college age children. Um, with their with their consent and with their awareness and and with a whole bunch of ethical principles surrounding the usage and norms. But the point is information confers power. That's why we use information. That's why companies and governments and individuals are so keen to seek information. Information is power. Privacy is about power. And, and our struggles over privacy rules are in reality struggles over the rules that constrain the power that human information confers. We should focus about those rules. That's the strategy that our law, going back to Magna Carta in 1215, and even before that, that's why we have rules, in to, is to constrain and shape social power, like the sort of social power that information provides to socially beneficial uses. Um, from that perspective, whether we do something or nothing, whether we do something clever or something foolish, something wise um, or, or something narrowly cynical, we're going to have privacy rules, even if we just allow the status quo. So privacy rules of some sort, let companies do what they want, widespread unmonitored NSA surveillance, that's a choice, that's a rule, if we don't do anything. Those rules are inevitable. And so we should recognize that fact. And, and I think the rest of the book argues that we should use the inevitable privacy rules we, we create or fail to create. Um, to shape the uses of human information towards human values, values we care about. Um, and, and in the, the final chapters of the book, I talk about three of those values. It's a, it's a non-exhaustive list. We can have other values. I think equality is a really important value that the privacy rules can create. But I talk about developing our identities as human beings. Who are we? Uh, what are we? What is our place in the world? How do we understand the world? Um, what is our religious sexuality beliefs or, or politics? Second, privacy can promote political freedom. Um, the, the idea that in a democracy, um, autonomous, free, authentic votes, um, not ones that are manipulated through scandals like Cambridge Analytica, um, not ones that are influenced by information warfare, um, that we should be able to figure out what our political views are and we should be able to meaningfully exercise those political views at the ballot box and in public debate. And privacy undergirds that too. It enables us to, to figure out what we think in an authentic, unmonitored way. It allows us to share those ideas with, with our confidants, our loved ones. Um, and it allows us to exercise and develop our political views, our expression and our voting behavior free of, of monitoring the chilling effects of surveillance or interference. And, and then finally, um, in the final chapter of the book, I talk about uh, the importance of privacy as serving the value of consumer protection, right? We are, we are building a set of rules to protect consumers in the information age, the way we had to build a set of rules over decades to protect consumers from the, uh, the tremendous challenges of the industrial age. Things like uh, clean water and air, pure food, safe products, um, uh, all, think of all the rules we, we put in place just to channel the car into a safe uh, and hopefully uh, not environment destroying um, invention. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to develop a better set of, of information rules for to protect information age consumers. Um, privacy rules in that context can serve the value of of consumer protection. I, I do some other things in the book. I, I debunk a series of myths, which I think we're going to talk about. Um, I, I conclude ultimately, though, that um, we need to start talking about privacy for what it is, not a not an outdated value, not a not a not a vanishing thing, um, but a but an a fundamental and essential, a foundational human right that we as individuals, that we as members of society need in order to preserve our, our hard-won civil liberties, to preserve our uh, uh, hard-won notions of, of individuals being the foundation, free individuals being the foundation of a, 
of a democratic self-governing open society. Um, and that's gonna require a, a lot of hard work, but I think the first step is, is to realize that privacy isn't dying, that privacy is fundamental because information is power, because information provides power over humans, because privacy can safeguard those humans in an information society privacy is the whole ball game. Um, and, and that's why privacy matters. Thank you so much for that recap, um, Neil. And I, uh, one of the things that I love about your book is yes, you talk about what privacy is and I appreciate that summary that you gave us, but you also do the more unusual thing about talking about what privacy isn't. There's a whole section on what privacy isn't, which I just loved. And when I'm teaching privacy, I often will ask students as they're coming into the class, you know, what does privacy mean to you? What do you think about privacy? And a very popular answer is the right to control in my information, my data. And you include in your chapter on what privacy isn't, the uh, privacy means being able to control how your data is used. You characterize that as a myth. And I would love for you, I think this is such an important point, and I would love for you to talk about that, particularly why is control an illusion and why is it insufficient? Yeah, right. that's a, that's a great question. Um, and when I was writing this section of the book, uh, I, I realized that this is, at least for privacy professionals, that this may be the most controversial claim in the book uh, because, because control, the idea that, what privacy means, what particularly what data protection means, is the ability to control how your information is collected and used has, be, has been such a foundation of, of privacy thinking for half a century um, and, and such a foundation of pro-privacy, privacy protective thinking for half a century. But it's interesting when, when you see entities like Facebook and Google um, that for many years resisted uh, privacy regulation as, as chilling and stifling innovation or um, you know, being bad for their business or you know, a, a, an outdated value, as Mark Zuckerberg said. So we just went for it, uh, as if that just excuses all of the crimes that Facebook has committed over the past 15 years, in, including allowing you know, electoral tampering, among other things. Um, I wondered why all of a sudden is, is Mark Zuckerberg going to Congress in a suit, which is very inauthentic for him, um, and using the word control something like 115 times over the space of his, you know, here at Facebook, we want, to, we want to put people in control. In principle, that sounds good, but I, I got suspicious. And so, you know, I, I think about control as an idea. In principle, it's great. You know, in, in the 1970s, when there were only a few databases and maybe you, your, your, your census data and your, your you know, um, your credit score, there weren't really computers in people's homes. Putting people in control was practical um, and, it, and it was useful. You could, you could exercise informational self-determination over a few databases. Um, but today there are almost an infinite number of, of, of databases and services and platforms that the ordinary consumer use, right? There's a famous study that you guys I'm sure know about um, from about 10 years ago that it would take 76 days just to read all the privacy policies um, that the average consumer encounters on the web alone in a year. Um, you know, we have all of these privacy dashboards and, and privacy opt-outs. Um, I, I went, I, I was, uh, about an hour ago, I was trying to decide what to make for dinner tonight. And I went to Jamie Oliver's website, which is hosted in, in the UK where the privacy rules are better. Um, and I received one of these uh, you know, accept cookies or, or go further down. And, and you know, I'm, I'm for, I like to think I'm fairly knowledgeable about privacy, um, but I just wanted to get to the recipe. Um, I just wanted to know, you know, what are the two sauces he's serving with the steak? Um, and I just accept all because it's just so difficult. Um, if we think about all of the, the passwords that, that, we, that we have, right? Um, you could use a password manager, remember one password, and then hope that your password manager doesn't fail. Um, or you could do what some people do and use the same password over and over again. That's hard. Um, we can't remember all of our passwords. Um, what we do is we write them down in pencil um, and we keep them in a safe place, thinking that our home is more secure, that please don't rob us, um, that our home is more secure than um, some, some uh, software company we, you know, we don't really know very well. But 
control is just impossible. If we can't remember all of our passwords, how can we imagine all of the privacy settings and privacy policies for all of those accounts that we have passwords for? How can we manage those when, when the, the, the technology and the uses are constantly shifting, when we don't understand um, the technology? Even those of us who are privacy lawyers who can read the privacy policies can't always understand the legal language or what the legal language actually refers to. And we certainly can't understand the consequences. So, so in, that, in that world uh, where control is overwhelming, where second control is actually an illusion because Facebook, to use them as an example, they don't give you the real choices like opt me out entirely out of personalized ads, um, opt me out entirely out of cross device tracking, opt me out entirely over uh, massive surveillance just so you, so I you know so I'm, I'm likely to buy um, you know all birds over over all guys right that, that I get sir I get this sort of these ads for these shoe companies all the time um, and actually I own two birds of each so maybe the ads work um, but control is is an illusion because we don't get those real choices um, in addition and this is really significant and this is why I think com these companies love this this approach control. Um, completes what I call in the in the book the creepy trap, the idea that we're sort of weirded out by these technologies and their data collection. Um, but ultimately, you know, as I did this morning on the Jamie Oliver website, you get the choice. I could have managed my my cookie preferences on my iPhone only for one particular cooking website out of the you know hundreds of websites I visit in a year, and that's assuming the preferences will be sticky um, next time I go. Um, but I didn't. I, I, I clicked through, I accepted all cookies. So I wanted to not manage my, I wanted to actually get the information um, so I could learn how to maybe make this dinner tonight. Um, but they gave me a chance. I had an opportunity, um, even if it was fleeting and limited and, and technical and distracting. Um, I didn't take it. So really it's, it's my fault. That's the argument, right? That, that, that's, that's the logic of this move to control. Um, because they know, particularly given their power to design the choices they want with big bright buttons and the choices they don't want are like hidden in a sub menu or in a tiny voice and then tiny button. And, and if you click, are you sure you want to you want to do this? You could be you could be foregoing really valuable opportunities if you don't if you if you opt out of this. So really, you should opt in to, so we can give you a better service. Um, they know we're going to take. Uh, the overwhelming proportion of us are going to take the choice they want, the choice they design the service to create. And that's why um, control is a trap. In theory, control is wonderful. Um, but in practice, in, in reality, and in, in the environment, the digital environment that all of us as digital consumers find ourselves, control is a dangerous illusion. And we should, and we should reject it as the solution to privacy problems. Well, Neil, that uh, I'm I love this is a great point to emphasize that if we're in an environment, then when we should be rejecting control as the over, overriding operationalizing form of how we get privacy, you know, it, it makes me think about the one of the last sentences in your book where you say privacy is the whole ball game. And it made me think of that, well, all right, if it's if it's a ball game, if it's a whole ball game, what game is it? Because I don't know what the rules are right now. It's like Calvin Ball from Calvin and Hobbes, where the participants <laughs> are like making up the rules as they're going along. And that if it's not that control is the rule, uh, mm -hmm. and if that's not going to be necessary, it makes me wonder as we move as. You surveillance, but of hybrid surveillance, where we have surveillance from the government, along with uh, surveillance from the private sector, and that those are working together. And, and that if that's so incredibly important for the concepts of power, and this concept of freedom that you're talking about, what should our, how do we go about setting a system of rules for that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think we should set rules for reasonable human values, this being an ethics center. Let me, but I, that's not satisfying on it. Let me be a little more specific about that. I think what we need 
is an environment, it is an informational environment, is a privacy environment, a consumer environment, a voter environment, and an individual environment, um, in which we do get to exercise choice. Right? I'm, not, I'm not saying that the controller choice has no place when it comes to privacy, but this idea of, of us all as these, these, these rational uh, actors of limitless resources and intelligence and information um, making these choices insufficient. So I think we need to get to a place um, where we can exercise preferences, but we can do so against a backdrop of substantive rules that protect us from exposure, betrayal, manipulation, financial loss, filter bubbling, um, and, and all of the, the, the many do well-documented ills of, of, of whatever we call our age, whether it's the information age or the digital society or the age of surveillance capitalism or informational capital, whatever that is, that we exercise a set of choices um, where the really dangerous options, the, the betraying option, the options of betrayal, the options of um, fraud and unjust enrichment for the platforms and the, and the governments are taken off the table. Um, and I think a good analogy is, uh, I, I, as you know, I talk a lot in the book about the parallels between the industrial revolution and what we had to do through law. And it wasn't perfect, but we did a pretty good job of protecting people against information age dangers. We need to do something similar sorry, for, for industrial age dangers. We need to do something similar for, for the information age. So I think about when I go to the grocery store, um, I can be pretty sure because of a whole set of legal rules, most of which are opaque to me even as a legal scholar, but I can trust that they're there, that there's not gonna be dangerous chemicals uh, or, or, or you know, dangerous bacteria on my lettuce. Um, that the, the, there's not going to be arsenic in my yogurt or lead. Um, so I can choose, and maybe I can even make some dumb choices by going for the potato chips um, within a range of options, but, but knowing that I'm not being manipulated and that the, the choices that face me are, are not ones that are going to cause me uh, unforeseen and, and potentially catastrophic harm. And so we need a set of rules around uh, digital information that are like this. So what would these look like in practice? So, so for um, promoting a, rules promoting our identities, I, I think we need to build uh, safeguards into, um, into, into social networks and, and search engines through ethics or law or, or financial incentives or tax policy or reforms of the corporate law that make it difficult for them to pigeonhole us in and, and to, to shape our identities in ways that are just better for the machine of capitalism um, and allow play, as Julie Cohen puts it, for uh, weirdness and eccentricity and um, uh, dissent. For, for governments, I think governments do and should, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have security services or police, Governments do and should have a, the, the ability to access sometimes even very personal information, but they need to do so upon the demonstration before a neutral tribunal, like a judge, that they have a right to it. So, so bulk metadata surveillance is deeply corrosive of, of political liberty. Um, but a search warrant, like uh, the, the ones they used in the wire to, to obtain the contents of the um, the, the phone calls in a criminal conspiracy, not, not season five, where they ignored the wiretap act entirely and went totally off the rails. Um, that was bad. Um, that's what, what we need. And we need that for, um, for digital platforms, for location privacy. We're seeing this in the Fourth Amendment space, but we need ECPA reform. We need federal wiretapping law reform to, to fill these gaps the way California actually has with its um, Cal ECPA law. Um, required a, a warrant before cloud information can be protected, and for and for consumers, I think we need to um, we need to put more teeth in uh, FTC unfair and deceptiveness uh, powers, and also enforcement 
um, uh, funding. Uh, we should think about uh, regulating the use of behavioral science uh, turbocharged by data science to manipulate consumers um, and to take advantage of, of known either general or individual cognitive vulnerabilities. Um, uh, we should regulate dark patterns and we should, we should, I think, and the other controversial thing in the book, I think, is um, we should maybe rethink this whole notion of the, quote, free internet um, and, and prohibit companies from saying that something is free um, if they're, they're making a vast fortune on the back end from, uh, as they would put it, uh, monetizing our data. Um, to, for, for, for companies like Google to say that its search engines are free, um, I think is a lie because they've been able to make the, one of the greatest fortunes in human history um, incrementally through microtransaction after microtransaction, uh, scraping, processing, assembling, packaging, and selling um, human information. Um, we might decide that Google search is worth it, but I think it's tremendously dishonest and it should be illegal for them to say that it is free, particularly when they're making such a vast fortune uh, on the back end. Uh, well, Neil, I'd love to throw in, I think that, you know, when we think about Google making money, Facebook making money, as you're talking about, I mean, it's largely from ads, the whole ad tech side of their um, companies. And I think that more and more consumers are very aware that of the advertising system and uh, of, of targeted advertising, behavioral advertising, they're learning more about this is how the weird things show up on their on their Facebook feed, the, the ad of something they actually are interested in. Um, but people in the privacy community are really talking a lot, I feel now, about privacy's relationship to democracy. Privacy is being necessary to democracy. And I think this is something that gets a little less play in just general circles, um, just uh, average people talking about privacy out there. And one thing that you talk about in your book quite a bit is um, our lack of a, a clear understanding of the harms of surveillance, both government and corporate, and the, um, the need to understand in particular persuasion related risks mm -hmm. to democracy. And so I think it's such an important point. I'm wondering if you could elaborate just a little for our audience on why privacy and persuasion are related. How is that happening? Absolutely right. This is one of those those issues, like the 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 its best example, which is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, that people have heard about, but until at least with my students and and people that I that I, that I'm close to that I talk to, until someone sits them down for ten minutes and explains why it is important, um, it's hard to get, and it's hard to sort of understand at a visceral level. We don't have 10 minutes, um, but so let me say this. The, the same technologies that can be used to persuade you to buy something or to not buy something, the same interfaces, the same insights of behavioral economics about uh, our I guess at Duke, we can say this because because Dan Ariely is on your faculty, right? The, the ways in which human beings are predictably irrational. The same technology that can be used to persuade and manipulate you, um, turbocharged by finely grained personal data profiles in the commercial sphere, can also be used just as easily to persuade you in the political sphere. Um, the data doesn't care. The algorithms don't care. Very often the data scientists, to their great shame, don't care. Um, the, this distinction we make as human beings between commerce and voting, between uh, commercial brand loyalty and political partisanship, which I think are real distinctions, um, though they do blur a bit at the edges, there's no distinction for, for these technologies. And so, so Cambridge Analytica was a, a British psychological warfare company, used the techniques of military grade psychological warfare and electoral manipulation that it had honed on behalf of MI6 and the CIA in the Caribbean, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, 
which we should argue is is problematic in itself. Um, but to a to a Western audience, they used that in the Brexit referendum on behalf of the Leave campaign, and they used it in the 2016 presidential election first on behalf of the Ted Cruz campaign, and when they uh, they, they lost out to the Trump campaign on behalf of the Trump campaign. This involves persuading people through finely grained uh, advertising, uh, political advertising that is tailored, and this is what Cambridge Analytica did with the, the data it stole from Facebook, um, with Facebook's perhaps tacit acquiescence in this, um, individually psychologically tailored profiles about what kinds of arguments are likely to get you to vote for someone, or if you can't get someone to vote for your guy, you at least get them so disenchanted by politics and their candidate, they don't vote at all. That's that's voter suppression. And that works too. So a lot of the, 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 the frankly, you know, racist and sexist, abhorrent advertising about Hillary Clinton um, was, was, was dropped by Cambridge Analytica against, against men in, in communities of color um, to suppress the vote. And so th that's why this matters. And let me also say, this is not a left-right thing. The, the Obama campaign used a less sophisticated version of the same technology um, as part of their, their campaigns in uh, 2008 and, and 2012. And, and I, maybe I'm just naive, um, but I, I, I aspire to a better world in, than in which our political decisions about who is going to govern what our policy should be, um, should be decided by, by human beings thinking rationally rather than which group has the best data scientists and the, and the best resources to collect data and to deploy it using these, these uh, you know, psychological warfare uh, techniques um, uh, in the intimacy of personal devices and in, in, in the privacy of our homes. Neil, I'm wondering if you could extend that maybe just a bit, and I know we're going to open up to questions from the audience soon too. Um, the, you talk in the book about something that I found really interesting, which is this concept, not just of manipulation, but about abuse. A and the concept of abusive practices being regulated under Dodd-Frank, but under the FTC, we generally just have regulated unfair and deceptive practices. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what would it be like if we transition to rules around the uh, abuse, particularly the abuse of power in these power relationships with respect to privacy? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think we need to regulate consumer, we need to regulate to protect consumers as those consumers really are, rather than as our economic ideology would want them to be. So I, I call this in the book, the situated consumer. Um, and, and we're used to in privacy debates here, oh, consumers have a choice. Consumers can choose free services. Uh, consumers can read privacy policies and make educated choices and go to the privacy dashboards. And th no, right, they, 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 they can't and they don't because human beings um, can be rational, but we are predictably irrational, again, to use, to use Dan's phrase, um, in ways that behavioral science has, has, has documented, right? So, so, and consumers too are situated in ways that um, sometimes the, the, the unduly optimistic and self-serving rhetoric, economic rhetoric of, of, of platform capitalists, um, doesn't reflect, right? Consumers don't just have to make in their day the decision about the cookie preferences on a single you know, steak with two sauces recipe on Jamie Oliver's website. Um, we have a whole bunch of other uh, duties and responsibilities and burdens, many of which have been dumped on us by changes in, in technology models, right? So we make our own airline reservations and we, we have to engage in carpool now. Um, we have parents to care for and sports practices to take children to, uh, taxes and voting to do, groceries to buy, meals to prepare. We're supposed to exercise and get a, get a good night's sleep. I think the law should meet consumers where they are. Limited in cognition, limited in resources of time, and energy and attention, um, distracted 
uh, confused bewildered by technology, sometimes even a little bit drunk, perhaps, right? That, that we need to make laws for, for consumers as they actually are, rather than consumers as, as uh, neoclassical economic theory uh, without the benefits of behavioral economics would have them be. Actually, the FTC Act used to treat, as, as I'm sure you guys know, used to treat consumers exactly that way. Um, it was only, I think, in the, in the, in the 80s uh, with, the, with the amendment of the the unfair trade practice with subsection N um, that, that, you know, unfairness now means substantial harm that isn't outweighed by benefits to consumers in general or, or to commerce. I think we, it, we should be allowed to be confused as consumers. We, we should be able to make our choices in our day about lettuce or kale or potato chips, um, you know, without the fear that that significant harm is, is, is going to happen. And so abusiveness is this idea that uh, we have these, these documented behavioral biases, uh, status quo bias, optimism bias, um, uh, we're, we're susceptible to anchoring and framing effects. Um, these effects are much more pronounced in digital environments where companies can design the interfaces to, to maximize the effect of, of these irrationalities. Um, and in which they can use vast amounts of personal information coupled with the behavioral science um, to, to, to sort of turbocharge the effects of these. And so a, an abusive trade practice, you could imagine an amendment to the FTC Act um, to prohibit, continue to prohibit deceptive trade practices, to continue to prohibit unfair trade practices, maybe also repealing subsection M, but also to prohibit abusive trade practices, the intentional use of, of, of cognitive vulnerabilities um, to, to influence consumer choices against their benefit. Um, we already do this for children. Um, and, and, and people will say, well, well, you know, Richard, isn't your approach paternalistic? Um, and my response would be, well, actually, compared to the massive power imbalance, you considering the massive power imbalance we have with these platforms, um, in individual commercial transactions, we are effectively children with respect to the, the, the power that we have, the actual power that we have. And so a, a, a regulation of abusive trade practice, as you say, with, the, with the, uh, the precedent of abusive practices being prohibited by Dodd-Frank, I think would be a really useful addition um, to, the, to the regulatory framework and to the FTC's arsenal. And actually, something you don't see in, even under the GDPR. In, in, in Europe, I think that would be an opportunity to put a really um, quintessentially American progressive stamp on, on not just US privacy and consumer protection law, um, but the, the, the global app to think about these technologies in, 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 in um, socially beneficial ways. Um, you know, we, we have one question from the audience so far, um, which is, what is a commonplace everyday aspect of our technological lives? And the examples given are um, like, for example, the use of QR codes or location tracking services. Um, what's, what's a commonplace everyday aspect of our technological lives that's more pernicious than we everyday people might currently be aware of? And I think then the question is, do you think our awareness of it would affect our use of this technology? Mm -hmm. Or is it, again, kind of outside of our control, given the way these things are embedded into modern products? Yeah, right. So, there, so th that's a superb question. Um, let, me, let me try and take both pieces of that. Um, if, if I had to pick two, and they're related, I would say, um, it is surveillance-based advertising is, is, is pernicious, particularly when it's coupled with an engagement-based, quote, free model. So it's only unpack that hopefully quickly. Um, surveillance-based advertising um, is, is this idea that uh, advertisers can make more money uh, or, or so ad servers can make more money to their, to their company clients if they can provide better information about the consumers. And so uh, as a result of that, because this business model is legal, um, there are economic incentives to collect as much information about as many people as possible 
in order to serve them ads that they can sell for higher prices. And so what this does is it creates the incentive for massive surveillance of everything we do because the advertisers can make more money and can compete with each other better, even if there's actually no evidence that more data actually makes the ads even more effective by the terms of the advertisers. Um, so we have this model. So whenever you see an ad, um, even, even the one with a little uh, blue triangle in the corner, but any particular the one with the blue triangle in the corner about ad choices, um, it, it is a sign of the, the, the rampant um, invasions of privacy that we're all subjected to all the time, simply so advertisers can make more money. And advertisers will respond, I'll say, hey, surely consumers want more relevant ads than less relevant ads. Um, well, actually, I think consumers would rather have no ads. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm old enough to remember the, 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 the tremendous optimism of the mid 90s when the, you, you guys are as well, uh, when, when the internet broke onto uh, the, the societies of the world, we built the internet for human empowerment and the advancement of democracy and, and connecting with people with other weird interests like ourselves. We didn't build the internet for more relevant ads. And I think that economic engine that has been really profitable for a lot of companies um, has in practice supplanted the purpose of doing this in the first place. Um, advertising may be a necessary evil um, for certain models we decide are useful, um, but it shouldn't be an end in itself. And I fear that it's become an end in itself driving massive surveillance. And the final part of this is these engagement models, um, companies that make money serving surveillance-based ads and only making surveillance-based ads only make more money when you're more engaged. So the more time you spend um, on these technologies, on these platforms, the more money they make. And this creates all sorts of nasty incentives for manipulation and gamification and attention sapping notifications. Um, and the not just so that our time is this idea of attention theft, that our time is stolen and we, we don't have the time for other more meaningful things because our devices are always pinging us. Um, but there's also pretty good uh, empirical evidence that, that engagement models, whether we're talking about, about politics, whether we're talking about uh, health or, or vaccine information and misinformation, whether we're talking about pornography, um, in order to keep getting people's attentions, more and more extreme content um, is necessary. So I would, I would argue, and I'm actually, Hartzog and I are working on another paper about, about this, this piece of this, um, building on some of the ideas in the book, that it's these engagement models um, that are really, really pernicious, um, at, not just for our privacy, but really the, the, the very fabric of our culture and our, and our democracy. That as much as anything might be what, what is dr driving us apart politically and socially um, in the media environment in, in which we, we find ourselves. Um, and at the core of that, right, is the collection of as much personal information as possible to, to, to make more money from these surveillance-based ads in order to compete in these engagement-based business models. Business models which are not only legal, but given the fact that corporate law requires corporations to maximize shareholder value for quarterly returns overseen by the FTC, our law actually perversely um, encourages these models while they're legal. And I think we can, we, can, we can take them off the table through things like better data protection laws um, and a duty of loyalty. And Neil, maybe a, a last question for you, because I know you also have deep expertise in free expression and First Amendment law. There's a question that was put up by Professor David Shanzer, my colleague, uh, saying particularly given the power that we see that's exercised through algorithmic amplification um, of content to shape what we see, um, how could we go about regulating and reigning in that power within the framework of what's going to be allowed by the First Amendment here in the United States? Oh my goodness, what, what a great question. This could be my next book. Um, so, so let me say- great that, if it would be your next book. <laughs> uh, well, the Duty of Loyalty book, I think will be the next book, but maybe the one after that. So, so I would say that as, a, as someone who's been teaching and writing about the First Amendment for a couple of decades now, what we think of the First Amendment is a legal rule 
um, that, is, that is the product of circumstances. And so many of the assumptions and doctrines that we have in the First Amendment, um, as it's currently understood, are ones that were developed in response to mass media technologies of, of the 20th century. Right? It's, it's, it's only in the 20th century we, we get a speech protected First Amendment in the United States. Uh, and so the First Amendment is not this, this, this timeless monolith any more than the Fourth Amendment, which we've seen you know, adapting to and, and really through the good faith on the part, the Supreme Court gets picked on a lot, but I think it's done a great job um, in the Fourth Amendment area for digital devices over the last 10 years or so. Um, I think we need, first of all, to resist the idea that, that I didn't want to say the words out loud, that data is speech, right? This idea that um, the First Amendment immunizes all information flows from government regulation. Um, that's just nonsense and, and something that I've explored in my scholarship. Um, I, I think we need to have sensible First Amendment rules um, that, that do allow uh, measured careful, checked government policies that do things like uh, break up media concentration, that do things like um, providing transparency um, in, in elections and in uh, media ownership and, and, and other, other forms of uh, cultural production at scale um, to drive things in a uh, more democratic direction. Right. So um, the First Amendment, the, the leading theory of why we have the First Amendment is not so people can be rude to each other or so that corporations can transfer as much data as possible. It's to promote rational democratic decision making by free self-governing citizens. And from that perspective, taking the, the purpose of the First Amendment, why Madison thought it was so important and why he wrote in the in the uh, the Kentucky Resolutions, um, his report on the, on the Virginia Kentucky Resolutions, why self-government is so important. Um, we need to craft our First Amendment rules to allow that. I think properly understood, the First Amendment would, would permit this. Quick example, Clearview AI argues they have a First Amendment right to scrape data to create facial recognition tools that they sell to, to the government, to the police, to ICE, to, to round up suspects and, and exert state power over them. Um, the Republic is not going to fall if Clearview AI is stopped from creating its, its technology of perfect Orwellian control through reasonable commercial or constitutional regulation. The Republic might well fall if we immunize these technologies of, of oppression from democratic regulation and, and allow their, their innovative and disruptive and, and unfettered deployment um, to, uh, to, to, to round us up, to polarize us, to suppress our votes. That, that's what I think we should be really concerned about. Maybe it's as good a place as any to end with uh, returning to, to Jolin's first question about the relationships between privacy and power and democracy, as well as, as consumer protection and identity development. Well, thank you so much um, for that amazing conversation, Yale. I really appreciate um, that you were able to join us for Data Privacy Day because I don't think there's any better conversation to have on Data Privacy Day than why privacy matters. Um, it, it was just perfect. Uh, I know that there were more questions that we didn't get to. As any of my students who are attending know, we could clearly have this conversation for several more hours today, but I know that um, But you have to move on with other things as well. So anyone who's interested in these issues, I highly recommend you to buy Why Privacy Matters, to read Why Privacy Matters. And for those of you who are students at Duke, I hope you will look further into the vast array of classes that you can take in privacy and cybersecurity um, at the business school, at the law school, in CompSci, at Pratt. There's all kinds of resources here. Uh, and I hope that you will take the occasion of Data Privacy Day to continue learning new things uh, in this area. And I want to thank Sanford School of Public Policy and Keenan for sponsoring this. And again, Neil, thank you so very much for taking your time to be here with us. Thank you for having me. And, and thank you to everyone for coming and, and listening to what we had to say. And, and uh, uh, hopefully we can do this again in person before, before too long. Absolutely. It'll be a date. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day.